Hello, Anna Maria. Hi. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview, an interview that, as you know, I'm doing on behalf of um, the special interest group from Maya Teffel, the Young Learners and Teenagers, uh, SIG. Um, just for the record, the interest in interviewing you started with the book you recently published, which we're going to be reviewing. I'm actually going to be in charge of reviewing it for our next um, issue. And then, well, you kindly agreed uh, to do this um, follow-up interview. So thank you very much for your time. Yeah, you're very welcome. I look forward to the questions. Always a pleasure to talk about it. <laughs> A very, a very nice book, which I'm, if you give me a minute, I'll try and share on the, on the screen for the reference of those viewing and um, listening to us. Um, and in the book, Engaging Children in Applied Linguistics uh, Research, um, you make a compelling case uh, that language research should not only be done on children and about children, leaving children in a rather passive role as maybe as traditional, but also with children and by children. And as language teachers, I think we all love a nice a nice pun, prepositional pun in this, in this case. So I was thinking that there seems to be a logic behind this proposal that if for quite some time now, we've said that children should be in the center of classroom action, then it makes sense to think that the research should not only be about children, but also with the children, and that e even children can do their own research, thereby um, research by children. Yeah. Well, thank you for that uh, very nice introductory uh, question. Yes, yeah, so this uh, book has been um, kind of coming for quite a long time because I've been thinking and writing and reading about this topic for quite a few years. Um, and um, yeah, there is certainly that logical connection that you mentioned that there's a lot of discussion about teacher, sorry, about child or learner centeredness, that we want our classrooms to be. Um, focused on the learners, we want to give the learners agency in their learning. So teachers are trying to do things that are interesting or meaningful. Many people talk about inquiry based learning. <clears throat> we talk about um, genuine interaction and genuine discussion in our classes. And um, of course, people conceptualize learner centeredness in, in different ways, slightly different ways. But these are kind of the ideas that will come up uh, when we talk about putting children in the center. And um, I often get this question, well, how is your idea different from that? Isn't this just good teaching, you know, giving children the opportunity to um, take agency in research as well? And I think that, um, kind of paying attention to research concepts and almost like training the children to become researchers is an additional layer. I think that learner-centered classrooms don't necessarily do that. Mm -hmm. um, some may do a little bit of it, but not uh, explicitly. They don't say, okay, that this is how you interview others, or this is what a good question looks like in a questionnaire, they don't pay explicit attention, I, I don't think, to, to research. So, so I see this as an additional layer to um, child-centered or learner-centered teaching. And um, I must say that, of course, I've been inspired uh, over the years by many other authors. And one of the ones that I would like to <clears throat> mention is, of course, Mary Kellett, who um, is retired now, but she worked at the Open University here in the UK, and she published um, a book which is about how to train children as researchers. So that book and Mary Kellett and her colleagues' work over the years has been a huge inspiration to me. And I think that those ideas about training children to become researchers are very, very powerful. 
of course, as a teacher, you need to make judgments about how much of it is relevant, how much of it is interesting, what you might want to start with, um, how can you incorporate this into your work, if at all. Um, but I do see it as a sort of explicit layer on top of um, learner-centered approaches. And I think I'd just like to make another very important point that um, the point of the book was to really open up this space and invite teachers and researchers to think about this possibility. I certainly don't think that research on children and research about children is something that we don't need anymore. Of course we do. Uh, those kinds of studies are extremely important. And for certain types of research questions, those are the kinds of studies that are appropriate. But I think that every teacher or anybody who is training to become a teacher um, should really uh, know about the possibilities of another type of research, uh, which is uh, with the uh, involvement of the children as active participants or core researchers, or even if there is opportunity, then you know um, the, the possibility of uh, helping them to become researchers in their own right is also something that has been done and there are very inspiring examples out there. So it's an attractive opportunity for people to consider. But I think it's just to open up this space and to make sure people become familiar with this opportunity. It's important to stress that other types of research have got their own um, important uh, place within, within the broad literature. Yes, Sorry, this make is it, a very long it, answer. You, you, no, that's that's very interesting. <laughs> you you make it very clear in your book that those two prepositions are not to be discarded. On the contrary, mm. on and about children, but just simply adding uh, the sort of niche that you've identified. Yeah. Right, that there are um, fewer by by far <laughs> studies mm -hmm. uh, of of. Um, children research with and, and and by children thank you for that answer thank you for the reference and the source we'll see if we can include some of that in any any text that accompanies this interview for anybody interested in in, in reading further now interestingly you mentioned uh, teachers and um to some extent your work is um about or for researchers so i wanted to ask uh do you think that research with and by children should also involve regular practitioners? Can ordinary classroom teachers aspire to engage their young learners in inquiry processes, even if they haven't got a lot of uh, formal training themselves as teachers in how to do research? Any, any tips you can give teachers or school managers in, in this respect? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's again a very important question. And um yeah, and, and I do understand that different teachers work in different uh, circumstances and they have to follow rules and they haven't got much freedom. And I understand all of that. But I do think that um, teachers are actually researchers and should should feel, should identify as researchers. And if and when they have got some space and some opportunity I very much think that they can conduct their own investigations together with their learners. And I guess, yes, it's important uh, to, th to think about where the research knowledge is coming from. So I see research as something that is a continuum between more informal types of research and very formal sort of academic type of research at the top end. And I see this as a long continuum, and I think everybody can place themselves somewhere on this continuum, and everybody can move forward or not, if they don't wish. I mean, it's not something that everybody must do. But um, myself, having worked in a university now over 20 years, obviously I need to be doing research some of the time that is at the higher end. and. That is my job. That is what I do pretty much day in, day out. So for me, it's very natural to be thinking about research and reading about research. 
And after so many years, I still see myself as someone who needs to progress forward. Because of course we we always we always want to know more about um, aspects of methodology or or what other people have written about the kinds of things we're interested in. So there's never an end point. And I think also, um, is there really a, a firm beginning point? Well, where is that beginning point? It is possible actually to get young children as young as six or seven years old to get them to interview each other. And for that, as a teacher, you might want to teach them about good questions, even if they're just gonna ask two, three questions each. So in my view and in my mind, that's a very low level, very rudimentary research training already. Of course, if you work with older learners, um, and if you can do more sophisticated research, if you're doing questionnaire design or something like that, you can achieve a lot more. You can teach them about biased questions. What's a biased question? You can't say, uh, you like pizza, don't you? Because that's a biased question. But you can ask that question neutrally. And that's, you know, how to make good questions is, again, rudimentary research training. Of course, you know, when 10-year-olds put together a questionnaire, it's not going to be as good as someone who is working with questionnaires at a higher level. But I do see this as a continuous progression on a, on a, on a continuum that is never ending. So if somebody has the interest, they can place themselves somewhere on this continuum. And if you're teaching your children about research, then obviously it goes without saying that you yourself need to also think about research, think about, read about research at the level of your interest. I don't think it would be appropriate for teachers to go right to the very top and consider publications that are really clearly aimed at other academics. But there are lots of, you know, um, user-friendly manuals, for example, how to interview, how to put together questionnaires. And, you know, um, the interests that teachers have, well, the limit is um, the sky, you know. <laughs> if you enjoy it, if you like doing it, then you develop together with the children and then you look into new approaches, new methodologies, as and when your interests, um, you know, makes that possible. So I do see it as, as something that children and teachers can embark on together, start somewhere where it makes sense to them and develop taking small steps um, if, if um, they're interested. I think it can be quite comforting for teachers to, to hear of a continuum, right? Mm. On the one hand, because we can avoid <laughs> the polarity, small r, big R in research, which is also um, yeah. interesting. But somewhere you know, the two um, need to kind of... Where is the line between meet. the two, right? Yeah. And yeah. I don't know if you'll agree, I often um, <clears throat> say that um, research is to start with a mentality, a mindset, and the teacher who is making notes and observing things and saying, well, I in the first 10 minutes of a particular lesson, I always see that such and thing, such and such a thing takes place. Then that's the beginning. That's maybe the first step towards action research projects, classroom-based research. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, no, I entirely agree. Um, but of course there are many other ways. So for example, we know that some teachers um, decide to work together. Um, and if they work together as a small group, maybe in involving the children um, in an active way, you know, they will come up with more ideas. They will bring more to the table. They can support each other. They might inspire each other. If they involve somebody who's got more um, research knowledge, well, maybe that person can, you know, recommend new ways of looking at stuff. So there's also a lot of collaborative research that can be done where by definition, the different partners in the team will bring different levels of familiarity, knowledge, ideas. Um, 
also with uh, teachers of... and students of, of other areas, because mm. as I read your book, although your focus <laughs> is on, on applied linguistics and foreign and second language teaching and learning, I couldn't help but think of a, of a global school perspective where your insights and, and your proposals, I think are equally valid for, for teachers of, of other areas as well. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it, that is that is true. Um, um, obviously, I wanted to write something that, first of all, speaks to language teachers because of my own background and because, um, you know, this is what I know most about. But um, it's true that any other area, so whether you're a maths teacher or a science teacher or whatever else you might be doing in a school, the ideas in the book are still um, very much relevant. And everything in between, because we speak a lot about content-based instruction or CLIL and different approaches and methods in which there's Absolutely. a fusion of the two of the two elements, uh, additional yeah. languages plus content in various formats. Yeah. So yes, and, and I did try to put the emphasis on, on the language side of things mm -hmm. because researching with children at very, very low levels of competence, uh, language competence, I mean, mm -hmm. um, might be difficult in the sense that may, they may not be able to talk about uh, the processes of research, for example, in that target language. If we're talking about a situation where there is a there is a mainstream first language and then a target language that they're learning. But as they get better, uh, I think more and more can become possible uh, in the target language. So, for example, if they interview each other or interview somebody or they make a questionnaire, these are examples I've already used. So I'm returning to them again and say that even if they use the first language for doing the interview or constructing or the discussion over constructing the questions, as long as the final questions are in the target language, as long as some kind of a product or outcome is in the target language, that might already be a step forward. And of course, we've got all the bilingual and multilingual classrooms where this is an excellent opportunity to actually bring all the linguistic knowledge to the table. And you can produce bilingual products or multilingual products. And you can actually encourage everyone to be involved using all their linguistic resources. And we are having this conversation at a period of time, which I think is particularly fertile with new constructs such as translanguaging and a move yeah. away from <laughs> thinking that L1 should be banned can help teachers of pupils that do not have a lot of competence in, in their additional language to, to, to think that the, the practice of the target language is, is not the only thing that matters and that we can construct the, the way towards language competence while working on other skills in the, in the meantime that may, may not ne necessarily be linguistic, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think there's another thing that's really important. If you're doing research and everyone is engaged in doing that research, then there has to be some kind of an outcome that is meaningful to everybody. So I would say that if, if it's the teacher's idea to do a particular type of research and the teacher is encouraging the children to help be part of that study in an active way, um, you will be more successful if the children are fully on board and they also interested in that topic. Um, and if everybody's interested, if everybody is excited, then there'll be some sort of genuine outcome that everyone will be proud of. Um, and I think it's really important to celebrate that outcome. So whether you want to organize an exhibition or whether you want to organize a big school assembly or some kind of celebratory event, I mean, I've seen uh, studies where the children and the researchers uh, at the end of the project, they, for example, give an interview to local radio. I know that's quite you know, ambitious and it might not be possible for every classroom and every teacher, but I think it's really important to think about how, how the final products will be 
acted upon, celebrated, shared, communicated in a way that um, it makes a um, statement that this is really quite important. There's nothing worse than doing research with children and then just putting your results in a drawer. If you just put the results in a drawer in your staff room, then you know everyone will in your class will soon understand that that's just that's just something that they had to do as a um, task for the teacher to prove that they can, you know, um, complete these tasks. It's 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 much more important. It's very important that the that everybody feels at the end that something has come out of it. Something has changed. Something has been improved. Something has been celebrated in in one way or another and it doesn't need to be a big thing it can just be a little mm -hmm. exhibition in a corner of uh, school and of course the more um, I also try and make this point in my in my book that you can involve children in very small ways and that's great and maybe that's all you can do maybe that's all that's achievable but the more you involve them, the more um, they get into it, the more they do the research for themselves, the more they need the whole school support. So in schools that take this sort of thing seriously, there's, there's absolutely 100% support for this kind of way of working. And, and you a can- synergy, A synergy, I imagine, that, that yeah. gets generated when different classrooms and different teachers it's inspiring really to see mm. all the cases that you report and as a as a teacher that has worked quite a lot with nine-year-olds and ten-year-olds as you say in your book how important it is to trust them to know mm. to know that they can you know to to empower them and the fact that they're young children doesn't mean that they're incapable of doing a number of things that as adults we might doubt whether they are mm. capable of doing until you actually get down to it and you discover how capable and easily motivated motivated they can be yeah no when they get really motivated and then they want to do it that is the big um, turning point, I think, when they get really excited about it, because, you know, they, they will still have to ask for help and they will still have, you know, difficulties and they will still have points where they think, oh, yeah, this is really hard. I'm looking forward to the next step, but this is really hard. So I'm not saying it's all just really easy, but it is it makes a huge difference that you don't have to beg them to carry on <laughs> because they will be very excited to to carry on yeah so just to ask you a couple of more general questions uh, Anna Maria um any particular projects that you're working on at the moment that you'd care to share with us so um unfortunately at the moment in September I became head of department here in my oh, university wow. congratulations so this has <laughs> been this has kind of killed off all my projects <laughs> because unfortunately this means that um, a lot of my time is devoted to administrative tasks and also we've got a little bit of restructuring going on within the university so that has added to it even more but I mean if if I if and when I get the time I I um, I am actually very much looking forward to running a research club in a local primary school. Um, and um, I've done this sort of thing before, so it's, it's not gonna be the first time. So I'm thinking of how to do it this time, how to change things. And I've been very inspired by the maker spaces, um, the maker movement. So what I would like to do is create like a, a corner in the school where it's all devoted to research. And so the kids, even when I'm not there and the club is not happening, which would only happen sort of maybe once a week because I can't go more often. But this little protected research place, place would be somewhere where the children could regularly go and they would already know what to do and where to find resources and how to work for themselves. So the idea that all the work wouldn't need to be done when it's like 100% supervised by myself in that one hour slot or two hour slot. So 
I'm very, very inspired by the maker uh, movement and, and the kind of play spaces and maker spaces that they describe. And I think it's got a lot of potential for work that is with children focusing on research and potentially, you know, language um, related research. I'm also it like you're not. You're, it sounds like you're not going to lose touch with with research and with classrooms, and somehow you're going to find a way. Not. Hopefully in not. Hopefully not, because I your find busy schedule. <laughs> yeah, I find this sort of thing really energizing, and also I guess uh, I'm very interested at the moment in climate education, and I know that in English language teaching there's been quite a shift to focusing on you know intercultural issues and global issues and environmental issues and civic education and those kinds of areas as as <clears throat> as important topics for um you know inclusion in in terms of um what what should we talk about in a in another language so climate education is exciting to me because i do think that there are some amazing projects out there in the world um, and I think those could be brought into uh, language education um, much more than is happening um, at the moment. I've also got some very close colleagues in Norway who are working on participatory research with children so um, in collaboration, we produced some mm, master level um, module material for master students. So for teachers, obviously, who are attending um, MA courses in Norway or at Warwick. But because of my commitments at the moment, I'm not actually teaching that module, but I've got it all ready to go. So <laughs> that's another project that I'm very excited about because I think the more MA students are familiar and have have some understanding of participatory ways of working with children, uh, the better it is, I think, in terms of spreading the ideas across different uh, contexts. Well, I suppose some of these comments tie in nicely with my my final question, which is a little <clears> bit like you do in your at the end of your of your book in terms of anticipating and looking ahead. If you could put your finger or, on on one or, or two areas of change that you'd like to see in in applied linguistics and foreign and second language learning in the next five ten years, um, what would those areas be? Mm. Well, um, I guess a uh, slightly different question is what would I like to see and what it is going to be? Because <laughs> these are two kind of um, related questions, but they're not the same. I think what we're going to see is um, even more um, complex um, multilingual uh, situations where we have great big differences potentially between uh, children's um, language levels, but teachers will have to learn to cope with that and mm -hmm. cope with even more uncertainty and even more um, teachers will need even more adaptability and resilience in the future. There's also, I think, a technological um, storm that is coming our way. So, you know, we know that all MA students are working with uh, chat GPT these days, but it's going to get into the hands of ever younger children. And it'll be interesting to see what eight and nine year olds will do with that kind of uh, software and with that kind of, um, uh, you know, sort of almost revolutionary um, difference. Um, and I know that the internet and chat GPT and, and um, kind of online learning is not a reality everywhere. In fact, there are big differences across different contexts around the world, and we mustn't forget about that. But certainly in some contexts, I think uh, technology will be an even bigger um, issue in the near future. Um, what I would like to see is I would like to see that both teachers and learners have 
at least a little bit more freedom to decide together what's appropriate and purposeful in their language learning curricula. I would like to see less high stakes assessment and more mm -hmm. ambition about, you know, how much young children and older children can do and will do if if they're given the opportunity and the responsibility and the right kind of encouragement to um, help them. Of course, everyone's talking about 21st century skills and the idea that our current education system is so outdated and yet nothing much has changed and nothing much is changing. Um, but I think sooner or later, we will have to just realize that we'd be much better off not to focus on you know, teaching facts in isolated subject areas, but in, in fact, we should be teaching much more cross subject areas and focusing on, you know, helping children to understand how to work well in teams, how to do plan and creatively handle project work, um, teach them about safety issues with regard to digital literacy and um, you know, allow them to be creative from day one, because the facts are now at our fingertips and not just the facts. I mean, chat GPT will write an essay for you about whatever you want, really. <laughs> so in that sense, I think I think a lot more emphasis on how groups work creatively together on projects that they come up with and on um, you know, knowledge that straddles uh, subject areas rather than separates them. <clears> How <throat> oh, interesting to have started with your book, which is such a recommended read <laughs> for anyone uh, watching uh, and to, to end up on, well, you shedding so much light on so many areas of, of our profession. Thank you so much, Anna Maria. Very inspiring. <laughs> Thank you for asking the questions and thank you for reviewing the book and thank you to um, the Young Learners Seek to um, do this uh, interview as well as the, uh, the uh, marketing around the book. Thank you so much. Thank you.